all marketing is simply communicating the journey from a before state to an after state. The longer the journey, the higher the price. Yep. And it's so true. It's that's what all marketing is, is it's a communicating a transformation and and transferring that that sort of feeling of transformation. Right. You are now listening to the Creative Juice Podcast brought to you by Entrepreneur.io. What's up, Indies? Welcome back to the Creative Juice Podcast. I am your host, Circa, with me for this entire month. We've already done two episodes. This is episode number three of Copywriting Month, is Jack McCarthy, our the, the man who holds our agency together. What's up, Jack? <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for having me back. Of course. This man. has been a really, really fun month going over copywriting, and it's a joy to be on the Creative Juice podcast. So uh, happy to be here. Hell yeah. Well, um, today we, we spent the last two episodes talking about first, you know, some some more 30,000 foot view copywriting, you know, ideas. And in the last episode, we did our best to convince you guys that selling isn't evil. It's actually something you do every day. And, and if you can just kind of change your mindset around it, you should be really great at it. Um, and now we want to really put all that into like the nitty gritty, which is, you know, where are you going to be writing copy and what's the process you go through to write good copy? Um, here at the agency and, and at Entrepreneur, I feel like everyone on our team writes copy in their own unique way, but there's some general tenets and principles that you can follow that'll make it a lot easier over the long run. Yeah, definitely. I think it'll be fun to kind of outline you know, a high level overview and see, kind of see the similarities and the differences between how on this episode, how you and I look at copywriting yeah. <laughs> and what those, what those process kind of oriented approaches are. Definitely. Yeah. So the, the first thing I want to get clear on is that we're going to give you guys a lot of practical tips uh, and, and kind of a nice workflow to follow, just like a step-by-step -step how to craft good copy. But it's going to be different for every scenario you're writing copy for. So the audience and the place that the copy – so the audience the copy is going to, the audience is going to read it, and the place the copy is going to be in – kind of bear on how extensive you want to be with this process. So for instance, if you're writing a short ad that's going to your greatest fans in the world and you're not asking them to do much, maybe you're just asking them to listen to a song, you don't need a whole lot of copy for that. On the complete other end of the spectrum, if you're talking to someone who's never heard of you before and you're trying to get them to buy, you know, a $1,000 uh, concert retreat with, you know, to come see your music and and spend a couple days with you, you need all the copy in the world because it's damn near impossible. So that, you know, how warm the audience, if they're more warm, you need less copy. If they're less warm or they, they haven't, you know, had a lot of interaction with you, you're going to need more copy. You're going to need to convince them a little bit more. And then on the, on the placement side, if it's a short ad, you know, then you don't have a lot of room for copy. And we do do long copy ads where there's like just paragraphs and paragraphs of copy, but in general ads, you need less copy than you would need on the other end of the spectrum where you might be making like a sales page or you might be creating a video sales letter that's supposed to explain the benefits and the features of a product and convince someone to buy it. So that that has a bearing on how much copy you need to write and how much you need to do in order to get well-written copy. And then lastly, the ask. What are you asking the audience to do? If you're asking them for something that doesn't, you know, it doesn't require a lot of their time or money, then you can be a little bit shorter on the copy. But if it requires a large amount of money, it requires a lot of their time, you really need to explain it to them. Yeah, definitely. And I think, uh, I think it's good to point out, like, uh, this is so context specific, you know, um, where, where, what you're writing, what placement you're writing copy for, um, can really, can really bear, it, it has a big bearing on what the copy is going to look like, uh, depending on what your end goal is, you know, for example, like you're not trying to sell someone your product in the ad, you're trying to get the click to the sales page most of the time. So it's, it, I think everything, that you, what you were saying, it kind of works like a, 
like a bicycle almost or a tricycle. Like <laughs> all of these things are moving in tandem. Yeah. Um, and you kind of have to think about all of the, the whole function of what you're trying to do and how you're writing copy for each individual piece to get you to your end result. Yeah, 100%. So yeah, the we do want to make those clear is that those are kind of the three scales that you're going to need to consider. How warm is the audience? Warmer means less copy. Uh, where is the placement? If it's if it's like you know something they see thousands of every day, then you can use less copy. If if it's something that's unique that has a high ask or has a lot of opportunity for copy, like a sales page, you need more. And then lastly, if you're asking them to buy a thousand dollar product, you need the most copy. If you're asking them to watch a video, you don't need that much copy. And so that's going to inform how many of these tips you you kind of uh, you, you use as a weapon in writing your copy or, or as a tool. Um, so we kind of want to get down like a, a light process for how to write copy. Now, I personally learned my copywriting chops from some of the best sales letter and direct mail writers in the world um, in history. Um, you know, guys like Gary Halbert, guys like Dan Kennedy. And these are, that's the source, man. That's the wellspring. If you want to learn these processes in and out and you want to become great at this, which you don't necessarily have to become the best copywriter in the world to get a lot of great results out of, you know, a little bit of effort, kind of the 80, 20 rule applies here. You can get 80% of the way there on 20% of the effort. And the last 20 will take 80% of the effort. But it's definitely a great thing to get into. So I didn't, I didn't want to go forward without referencing those greats and, and making you understand where Jack and I have taken our cues from. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, the beautiful thing is, is there's such a wealth of information out there um, that you can find on copywriting. You know, like the internet, the internet is like a vast library of resources for copywriting from all sorts of all sorts of influences and all sorts of experts. Um, so I would say like for, if, if you're looking for resources to dive into, like go to, go, go to Google. That sounds so stupid. Go to, go to Google and find something that resonates with you. I think that that was one of the biggest things when I was uh, learning how to write copy and, and reading copy from, you know, some of the greats and practicing. Um, a lot of that started with finding something that felt good to me as I was reading it. And I was like, oh man, like I like this style. It's almost like writing songs. And this is kind of like going back to what we were talking about in the first episode that we did together uh, on copywriting, how so much of this is uh, synonymous with songwriting and how much it can really apply. I think the process uh, kind of works the same way. And even, you know, the influence works the same way. Your, your songwriting is influenced by um, songwriters that you like. Your copywriting can be influenced by copywriters whose work you admire. Yeah, 100%. And that's why, you know, if if you consider yourself at all, you know, good at marketing, you probably have a swipe file. You probably have a folder of screenshots of ads and emails and and text files of marketing copy that worked on you or that you that you particularly admired. And that's where you can derive a lot of your cues yeah. from. Um so that's a good habit to have. Now, when it comes to sitting down to write, there's a few things that you need to know about the structure of a well-written sales letter that translate into how you might write a video script to offer a product, how you might write an ad, how you might write an email, or how you might write copy for a sales page. Um, it all kind of goes back to the sales letter format where it all started, and that's why we've talked a lot about sales letters in this series so far. But the first thing you got to do before you write anything in any scenario, regardless of how warm the audience is, regardless of how little space you have to write the copy, you have to put yourself in, in the position to write great stuff. And the best starting place is where you understand entirely who you're talking to, who you're making an offer to, and you understand entirely the value of what you're offering. Because if you're starting from a place of, you know, you have a t-shirt to offer, let's say, to some of your fans. And you're just kind of, in your mind, it's, oh, they're my fans and it's a t-shirt. And that's all you have to start with. That's not the best starting place you could have. You could understand a little bit more about not only, okay, what type of fans are they? Like, what experiences have they probably had with you already? 
that's information that goes into understanding who you're talking to. And if you left it out, if you didn't catalog, okay, well, they saw this music video from me, they probably listened to this album. That's all fuel for writing great copy that you're leaving on the table if you're not kind of going back through it. Further, you know, what is their day-to-day like? What are, what, you know, what are their life's troubles? What, what are they concerned with? What are their hopes? What are their dreams? This is all prep work that gr- it sounds like it, it sounds like I'm just saying it. Cause I know when I first heard it, it took me years to really kind of have these eureka moments where I was like, oh, you do need to do these things. <laughs> like it's so important <laughs> because when you first hear it, it kind of sounds like, oh, you're just trying to fill space. You're just trying to give me some tips. Cause that's your job is to give me tips. But no, it it's so true. Like understanding what their day was like before they read your ad is huge. I think, um, I think, you know, just hearing you say that, sir, kind of made me have a a realization. Something just dawned on me. Um, I think one of the biggest places that I learned about copywriting and I didn't know that I was learning about it at the time was probably my, my 10th grade English class (laughs) in high school. Um, I had an amazing, uh, an amazing education in, in English um, at my high school. And I learned so much about storytelling, particularly creative writing and storytelling. Um, and I didn't know that years later I'd be applying it to copywriting, but everything that we're laying out here today in this episode is, is the framework that I was taught to think in, uh, when it came to telling stories and writing fiction and whatever, um, in high school. And those same like processes have just kind of been so ingrained in me as a writer um that i think you know i, I don't think i've ever realized how that it, that it went back that far until just now probably yeah yeah <laughs> um, so i gotta give a shout out to uh i gotta give a shout out to all of my high school english teachers for ingraining <laughs> these things in my mind yeah it's it, copywriting is not like writing for the purpose of convincing or, or persuading is it's it it is not another world from English literature. It really is not. Like it's it's a lot of the same principles and, and probably because all writing is for the purpose, all communication is for the purpose of a, of a desired end result. Um, maybe you're persuading someone to understand information, but that's still persuasion. Um, so yeah, it, it, it shares a lot of corollaries there, but really getting down to the root of who you're talking to by just exhausting all your options. A lot of it you won't use, but that 20% that you do use really matters. So, and and you can't determine beforehand, like, oh, I could probably not think about what their day is like, but just get down, you know, who they are and what age they are and what gender, and I'll be fine. That's not the case. You might not use any of that information, you know? Um, So really going through, okay, what was their day like? Uh, What are they worried about? What are their hopes and dreams? What do they aspire to? What types of language do they use based on what you know about who they are? What are their age? What's their gender? Where do they live? And this is all, a lot of this is going to be what we call creating a customer avatar. So it's a guess. Like if I say you live in, you know, nowheresville, Montana, like what I mean is you don't live there, but you, you live somewhere that has corollaries with that place. So if I say you live in New York City, okay, maybe not New York City, but a big city or a heavily congested city. So you're really just trying to make like an image in your mind of this person you're talking to. So instead of writing to a nameless, faceless sea of people, you're writing to a very specific person, which will make you write better, 100%. It'll, it'll make you write so much better to just picture that person across from you and what you're going to say to them. But it also cues you into what the right manner of speaking, what method of speech you employ with that person. And then once you know who they are, you can start to get down what conversational style am I using? Am I shouting at them over a crowd? Am I calling out to them in a crowded mall as they walk by? Am I calling them on the phone and and having a heartfelt convo with them? What's the style of speech? That all comes from picturing that, being able to perfectly picture, you know, Sue from from Wayland, Massachusetts, who drives this car and has this many kids across from you, you know? I was just going to say, giving the person that you're envisioning a name oh, yeah. um, is a really good way to is a really good way to connect to that human element there. Um, so I'm glad you mentioned the name Sue. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah you really and, and that's called the customer avatar. You want to get down like a person that you can use as a stand-in for all the people who are going to be seeing this particular bit of copy, and that's 
a big important part of putting yourself into place um, and and getting a great starting point for writing. Uh, the, the questions that I like to ask myself are who are they? Where are they? What are they doing? Like, what are they doing when they encounter your copy? Are they at the dentist's office? Are they, do they have a car full of screaming kids and they get a notification on their phone? Where are they? What are they doing? What are they seeing? How are they feeling? These are all questions that'll inform how you should write to them. And then the next part of preparation that's very important that most people don't do but should is to really understand what you're offering them because chances are when you go to offer your band t-shirt, you don't believe in that product in the way you should when you're talking to them. Or if you're just asking them to watch a video, you're not, you know, all that self-doubt as an artist, all that not wanting to be braggadocious or self-congratulatory, it creeps in way faster than effective understanding of your of your offer does, you know? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's welling up. <laughs> as you're preparing to write your copy, all of that self-doubt is just welling up. <laughs> yeah, 100%. So yeah, you really want to get down. What I like to do is I like to write out, and this is not uh, like, just like everything we teach, this is not me, guys. This is as old as the 1920s, is take what I'm offering them or what I'm asking them to do and write out all the features of that offer. So, okay, if I have a music video, right, that's three minutes and 30 seconds, and I did it in the style of this artist who I greatly admire, and, it, and its lyrics are about this, but they're not told in a frank way, they're told in a poetic way, and I use this, this circumstance as an allegory for kind of telling that story or painting those emotions. These are all features of that video, right? And so I need to exhaust everything about it. Oh, it's, it's in 24 frames per second. So it looks more cinematic. It's, uh, it is at a high bit rate. The color grade on it is this way. You know, like I need to understand all the, all the little descriptive features of that video or that band shirt or that concert ticket or, you know, or the concert that it corresponds to. I need to write out all the features. Now the difference between features and benefits is that benefits is some, is some future state that your audience will derive from the, from the offer itself. So like, for instance, a feature of this microphone I'm talking into is that it is a cardioid pattern microphone. It's cardioid so that, and, and you use the so that method to get the benefit. It's cardioid so that I can reject sounds around the microphone and stand in front of it and it'll pick up mostly my voice, you know? Yeah, I think the cool thing is, is that as you're, as you're really itemizing down from biggest to smallest of what it is that you're going to be offering the the features you know you're going to be able to you're going to be able to have a list of features in front of you and the benefits to your audience are going to just I think they're going to start to just reveal themselves. That's at least what I find happens to me um, when I'm getting descriptive about an offer. Um, things just kind of it's like the scales fall off your eyes, you know yeah. um, you're writing these things down and it's like, oh wow, like, to me, this is, this is inherent. Like I, I don't think about this. It's just, it's, it's what I put together and I've, I've kind of lost sight of all of the nitty gritty details, but your audience, your customer avatar, they don't know that they don't know these things. So spelling it out for them is being obvious and explicit is really, really important. Yeah. hundred percent. Yeah. You, you, as soon as you, and just like Jack said, as soon as you write out those features, it's, it's a lot easier to tie them to benefits, right? Like um, my phone has a headphone jack so that I don't have to buy a USB-C converter and spend extra money just to listen to it. You know, like that's with that feature, you might think, oh, that's old technology. Like what benefit can you derive from that? But it kind of just pops out as soon as, and I, you know, like I could list a million things before I get to the headphone jack on this phone. But that might just be the feature that stands out to someone or the benefit that stands out to someone. So writing an exhaustive list of the features of your offer and then deriving the benefits about it. Oh, it's, it's color graded in this way so that you, you, you're not getting bored while you watch it. It's visually pleasing and the colors just pop out at you. Um, you know, it's, it's three minutes and 30 seconds so that it's a nice chunk of listening, but it won't take the entire day and you won't have to disrupt your flow. Like that, that really informs the benefits list is the features list. So the features and benefits list, you're, you're never probably actually going to use anything you write down in that exercise verbatim, but you'll be able to pepper your copy with those features and benefits or elements of them 
just because you have them in the tank. You're, you're, you're starting from that point of fully understanding your offer. And, and the last bit I'll say about understanding your offer is like, it's easy to not believe in your, in your product or your offer, like whatever it is, it's super easy to not believe in it. Now add into that, that you're a neurotic musician and, and you're automatically not going to believe in your product. So you have to build yourself up. You have to convince your, you have to sell yourself on the product and the offer before you're actually going to be able to sell your audience on it. Yeah, that's, that's really what this exercise is, I think, really good for. Um, <laughs> it's, it's, make, it's selling it to you so that you can sell it to someone else. Yeah. And I remember when we were doing Dukes' album launch case study last year, his fan finder did so well that when I went to write copy to reach, I retargeted everyone who had watched his fan finder video. So like all this new audience, 1.2 million people. And they were so clam, they were so happy in the comments and so clamoring for this song that once it was on Spotify and I wanted to retarget them and point them to Spotify, it was easy because I so believed in this song. I knew that they wanted the song. I knew that I wasn't pushing something on them that they don't want. And I believed in it that much that I wrote super confident copy and I got some of the best results I've ever gotten on a campaign like that. And his Spotify went through the roof. And I, I think it all ties back to, I was built up with this extreme level of confidence just by how well that first piece of media did. And when I noticed the difference in my copywriting from that exercise, I, I had to actively try to replicate it in future campaigns because it's the best foot forward is to truly believe in what you're offering. And so, and, and, and the last thing I'll say about that is that like, you need to assume that the person you're talking to is the right person. So don't write copy for someone who doesn't want it. Don't write copy for someone it's not right for, rather. Write copy for the person it's exactly right for. So when you write out your features and benefits, write it to the person who needs all of those benefits. Right. You want to write for the right person at the right time in the right place who's, who's excited about what you're putting in front of them, not for the person who's off to the side and just kind of passively paying attention to your to your music video on Facebook. And it's it's funny what you've mentioned about um, Dukes' fan finder, sir. Um, obviously, like you and I and Corinne and the rest of the team have had multiple conversations and we sometimes call the fan finder campaign the dopamine hit. Uh, campaign in that it you know it generates results and new listeners on tap which is awesome but this kind of brings a new element to it that it's a dopamine hit <laughs> from like a creative and marketing standpoint and an educational standpoint even that it can it, with a well performing fan finder it can get you into that confident place to be able to say okay well like I'm ready to write copy to bring people into the next stage of my buddy system um which I think is really really cool it's a, it's a dopamine hit in a completely different way yeah 100% so yeah the the before you even start writing before you even open up your your email platform or ads manager or your website to write a sales page you should have all this stuff down you have to know who you're talking to. Who are they? Where are they? What are they doing? What are they seeing? How are they feeling? You have to know everything about your offer and you have to know everything about what those features or those characteristics of your offer provide in terms of value for your audience. So that's the benefits. And then you have to really believe that your offer is the best thing for the person you're talking to, which will be a combination of selling yourself on it and imagining that you're talking to the person for whom it's right. And once you're there, then you're finally in a place to start writing some copy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Now you're, now you're ready. Yeah. So the, the, the first exercise that you do in terms of writing is probably going to be that features and benefits list, but then it, it's really indeterminate as to what path you take to craft these elements. But you need to know that, Every great bit of copy and every great sales letter has the following components. One, something attention grabbing, something that gets them to stop and read. Oftentimes this will be a headline and a killer intro paragraph, something that just like paints the future state that they want immediately and then dials back to explain. So you need to grab that attention, and this is, you, you might recognize this is the AIDA formula, attention, interest, desire, and action, but we're going to kind of break it into its component parts a little bit. So you need to get them to stop, you need to get them to start reading. 
Stop what they're doing, start reading. There's, there's a lot of different mechanisms you can throw in to do that. You can use copy decoration. You can use an, an uncommon font or, or text decoration in order to get them to stop. You can use a pattern interrupt. You can use a clickbaity headline. There's all different types of things that can get someone to stop, but that's the primary goal at the beginning of your bit of copy. Then you need to make them understand that you understand them. You need to get them to really feel like you're not so different because we don't accept messages from people who we feel are way out in left field. We need to feel like, hey, I can identify with this person or this person understands me or a little bit of both ideally. So that's there's a, there's a portion of pretty much every great sales letter where oftentimes the writer will kind of bring themselves down off of a pedestal. Gary Halbert's, uh, I think it's Nerd from Ohio letter, which we referenced in the first podcast in this series, he starts off by saying like, I was a loser, right? <laughs> like, I, I'm not, I'm yep. nothing special. I don't, I didn't get good grades. You know, I don't get all the women. I'm not good looking. He kind of br really brought himself down to a level view so much so that his audience might feel that they're a little bit more capable than him. And a, another component of sales letters that does this really well is oftentimes in the, in the first page of the intro paragraph, they will call out the specific pain points of their audience, which definitely harkens back to the, what are they feeling? What are they doing? What are they seeing questions? Understanding your audience will allow you to call out their pain points by name. And nothing is more arresting than if I... For instance, you know, in my business, it's a challenge to, to keep solid books without some custom solution. Now, you know, like I have to code together a spreadsheet in order to get a quick read of our finances here at Entrepreneur and be able to monitor that. So if someone came to me and said, are you constantly pasting together complex spreadsheet codes just to get a read of your basic business finances? I'd be like, yes, you know exactly what I'm going through. I want to listen to everything you have to say, you know? Yeah, pointing out the pain points and then going a step further and agitating those is such a good way to, you know, to make someone interested in, in what you're writing and what you have to say and whatever the next step is um, and to get them envisioning a future state. Yeah, so it, it, it kind of serves a dual purpose here is if you're, if you're calling out a pain point that they have, you're not only showing them that you fully understand them and that you identify with their issues and, and that puts them in a place to feel like you might have a solution, but also it allows you this nice natural segue where just like Jack said, you can call out a pain point and then agitate it by saying, well, what's going to happen if you don't fix that? Or, you know, what's going to happen if you don't do something about this pain point? In Cirque's example, imagine what would happen if the IRS came knocking on your door today. Right. Would you have the records to show yeah. them? <laughs> Luckily, we have a separate set of books kept by our bookkeeper. But if I was still operating off of that spreadsheet, like, no. So if you caught me like a year and a half ago, that would be very effective with me. Um so yeah, like that's exactly what we mean it is you kind of, you paint a future state where they do nothing and you, you kind of make it, make them aware that that's negative. Now, this isn't always going to have- It's the anti-future state. <laughs> right, exactly. Yeah. And uh, Ryan Dice said, all marketing is simply communicating the journey from a before state to an after state. The longer the journey, the higher the price. It's kind of one of his like famous points. And- it's so true. It's that's what all marketing is, is it's a communicating a transformation and, and transferring that, that sort of feeling of transformation. So ultimately you're not going to always have a corollary for this with what you're offering. I mean, if you're offering a video, right. It, depending on how deep the song is, like you might not have a pain point that they're going through that your video is going to solve that you can agitate. But a lot of times, if you really dig deep or you really kind of think outside the box, you'll be able to find it. And that's, that's super effective copywriting fuel. Definitely. Yeah. And I think, I think I'm glad that we kind of harped on this, uh, making people understand that you get them, that you understand them, that you're the same type of person. I think that that's really important for musicians and, and artists especially to hear just because of the idea that like 
people put their favorite musicians on a pedestal and you have to be willing to step down from, even if you're not doing it and putting yourself up there, you know, um, there's a good chance that your fans might be. Right. So for you to step down from that in your copy and get you on a level playing field with them. Um, and so that in, in a way that, you know, is communicated well with them, that they can see it, that's going to put you leaps and bounds ahead of what so much, <laughs> there's so much bad copy out there, especially in the music industry is basically what I'm trying yeah. to say. Um, it doesn't even think this way. Um, so if you can if you can put yourself in that kind of framework, you're going to be way ahead of the game. Yeah, and so a lot of times calling out pain points is in the form of a question. You're saying, you know, don't you experience this, or wouldn't it be nice if this? And and that's usually the format for it. You can also agitate the pain points by by asking questions. You know, what if this happens? You know, what what would you do if this? Um, and and uh, once again, that's not always going to have corollaries to what you're offering as an artist. But the the people who will be most successful are those who spend a lot of time figuring out how, even though it's not obvious, that you can, that don't accept you can't find a corollary, that really dig deep to find it. Because the corollary for us as artists is always novel. It is always something we came up with ad hoc or ad hominem or whatever the correct Latin phrase is here. Um, you know, it's, 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 I can't give you a template or a blueprint for extrapolating the, the, the analog for something like some copywriter is writing for a product to your artistry, but there is one. And depending on how creative you want to be with it, you, you'll be able to find one. But really in this, in the second section, after you've gotten the attention, you need to generate the interest that can be done by calling out pain points. And it can be done by agitating those pain points and getting them really invested in, in clearing those pain points. But it can also just be showing them how you're the same or taking the steam out of the scenario, yep. injecting humor. You know, uh, Basic Printer, who's now on the agency team under Jack, he has great ads and some of the best ones he's written have been really, really pattern interrupty by sort of saying, look, this is an ad. We know how this works. He's immediately identifying himself as part of a group that the audience is also in. We know how this works, right? So he's sort of saying, yep. I'm yep. not fooling you, and I know I'm not fooling you, and no one's fooling us. So now he's put himself in a group with them in the first line of his ad. And that's you, you can't buy that kind of uh that kind of liking, which is what the the principle of influence is called. This liking. You're like them. Yeah. As soon as I read or even think about that copy, that headline, I start smiling. Yeah. And like, that's exactly the desired effect. Yeah. And, and it sort of invokes this feeling of the other, like all the other people putting ads in your newsfeed. Oh, they're jagoffs, right? We're, we know the deal, yep, yep. <laughs> you know? Yep. It's tribalism at its finest. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So you really want to make them feel that similarity to you, which is really just developing trust while developing interest, because I'm not interested in something from someone I don't trust. So kind of getting that familiarity, getting that interest, getting that, that trust, that liking in place is the next thing you want to do with your copy. This can be done in a sentence. It can be done in four pages. And in some of the most successful sales letters ever, it is done in four pages. So don't think that you can't make it one sentence, but also don't think that you can't make it, you know, four pages. And then after that, this is when you really get into explaining the value of what you're offering. And if you're launching from a pain point or an agitation of a pain point, this is really easy because then you're going from painting a future state where they don't do anything to painting a future state where they did take an action. So really what you're describing in this section is what it will be like if they take an action. And that dips back into like, you know, present state. So it can dip back into the features. Oh, let me explain it to you. Let me, let me kind of embellish on this for you. But in general, you're trying to get them to imagine a better future that could be right around the corner. And I know that that sounds like, you know, salesy kind of BS, but I, I can give you tons of examples where we really bring it down to ground floor. Where we re really bring it down to earth. We're not saying... 
you know, imagine if you had a million dollars and you were living in a mansion and all of your children's health care was taken care of and you had the money to take <laughs> vacations. Like, we're not saying that. Yeah, it's not, this isn't pie in the sky. Yeah, ideas. yeah, yeah. We're really saying like, you know, uh, imagine if you could throw on a song and instantly be transported to your best self, right? Or you could throw on a song and instantly feel like a badass. Because for me, when I'm talking about communicating the value of music, it's embodying archetypes. Music helps us slip into a movie role that we cannot get to by thinking. We can't think ourselves into embodying this archetype. We have to get out of our brains and into our bodies and feel like the badass we do yeah. when we're walking down the street listening to Green Onions by Booker T and the MGs. You know what I mean? Like, you can't feel like that by thinking. Yep. You have to listen to the song. So by communicating that archetype, you can oftentimes just shortcut yourself to the actual benefit of your offer if it's music. I think uh, this actually makes me think back to like the commercials that I used to see in the 90s, like the late 90s, early 2000s for like oldies records. And you would see them on like TV land or A&E and stuff like that. And the commercials would usually be like they'd be for like oldies um like compilation yeah. CDs or tapes a lot of or great whatever. And usually cheesy there would be, copy, but good effect. I was, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Super, super cheesy. Usually with just equally as cheesy yeah. visuals. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but one, but one of the, one of the, one of the things that they would say to communicate, to communicate this, the, you know, this future state would be like, imagine throwing on this song and being brought back to your glory days of, you know, high school football, dine in uh, or, or drive up movies and diners yeah. and things like that. Like painting a picture of where the music was taking the listener back to. Um, and come to think of it, those commercials were actually pretty effective. Yeah, yeah they definitely sold a lot of anthology series records. Um, <laughs> and you don't have to be yeah. that cheesy, right? <laughs> like um, y y it could be three words, you know, that that communicates what we're talking about here. But it is definitely an effective vehicle for communicating the value of what you're offering, especially if it's just music, especially if you're just trying to get them to watch a video or listen to a song, having this kind of Tr like trick in your in your bag of tricks is very very helpful yeah so i think for me like this kind of goes back to features and benefits again it's going back to you you itemized out all the things about what it is that you're offering somebody and all of its features down from and, and i say this again like i i use the word from the from the biggest to the smallest and i think that that's really important because we get lost in the we lose the minute details which are often where things really shine um I think going back to that, looking at those things and maybe just picking out like the, I, I would say pick out like the top three that come to mind based on the person that you know you're speaking to and where they are and what they're doing and what they're seeing, how they're feeling. What of those features and benefits that you outlined about your offer what paints the what what paints the clearest picture or the truest picture of the person that you're speaking to and i think that's where you start to determine okay well this is where the value is here's like my here's my big 3 um and then you can kind of build upon that and add to it um that's kind of like my my process yeah and just to call out Ryan Dice again of digital marketer digital marketer was really offering it was an information company for digital marketers by trade so all of their training helped digital marketers be better digital marketers. Then they created a product, uh, a suite of certifications in digital marketing that they originally thought were for their existing audience, digital marketers. And they communicated it as what if you get certified by a reputable company like us and then you could get jobs in major companies as a digital marketer. And that was kind of the pitch, but it fell flat. Their ROI went in the tank during this period of the company compared to what they were doing before. And then Ryan Dice realized that their true value and, and something that was a throwaway feature and benefit before became the main selling proposition, which is what if you could train your entire marketing team with one purchase? What if you could train and certify them so that you knew that they could do the job and all you had to do was purchase this membership? And that for, for business owners who, who didn't want to do the marketing but wanted someone else to do it, that was everything. 
And that's why their Digital Marketer HQ yeah. product exploded and companies like Uber started using it is because of that throwaway feature and benefit that they just was at the end of the list and didn't really matter and never was going to be used, but they did it anyways. And that became everything. So you never really know what seems throwaway today will be everything tomorrow when it comes to exhausting that list. And this is something that you and I kind of touched on, and it goes back to our first episode in this series, was how we were talking about you have to be willing to try, and you have to be willing to fail, and you have to be willing to test. Everything that we're talking about here is is wonderful in theory and in practice, but that doesn't mean that you're going to nail it every single time. Right. Um, and and that, you know, that example that you just gave with, with Digital Marketer's product is a good example of going back to the drawing board and saying, okay, what we did here didn't work. This copy didn't work. It didn't, didn't resonate with the right kind of person, or we identified the wrong type of person altogether. And we need to go back to the drawing board and, you know, look at what we did and start over. And I think that that's why having a process and having your own, you know, set of tools and tips and tricks and a workflow that you've developed for yourself is so important because you can kind of follow that breadcrumb trail back and say, okay, well, how can I, how can I look at this retrospectively and where can I improve? How can I fix it? What can I yeah. tweak? Um, what can I use that I didn't use before? Yeah. And so when we're talking about explaining the value of the offer, you've already gotten them to stop. You've got their attention and you've got their interest because they recognize you as someone that they can trust or someone who's like them. And you're really trying to just explain to them how you can tie your offer to their current state why it's the solution to where they find themselves today. And you can do that by that sort of transition of, okay, well, what if you don't solve this problem? How bad can it get to what if I told you this? What if there was a solution? What if tomorrow you could be, you know, walking down the street feeling like a badass? Or what if you had music to accompany you in your struggle to conquer addiction? What if you had a song that was your anthem, right? These are all things that might go into marketing copy for music, but that you can also start weaving in features and benefits here. So as you start casting that future state, as you start explaining your offer, you can sort of pose it as what ifs, but you can also just directly say it, you know, this song is this, or this t-shirt has this design, so that, and then benefit. And, and another vehicle that people use for just slipping features and benefits into marketing copy, copy, copy is bullet lists, right? bullets. Um, and, and yep. all too often we see amateur copywriters, marketers, and even artists using bullets to just list features, but that's definitely not what you want to do. You features are secondary to benefits. Benefits really move the needle. So your bullets should contain both ideally in the same bullet. So like if I'm, if I have a bullet where I'm listing a feature, the benefit should follow it. It shouldn't have to be another bullet for that benefit. And you can slip these into ads. You can slip them into emails. You can slip them into video sales letters, opt-in pages, sales pages. They can go everywhere and they can effectively get someone excited about what you're offering. Yeah. I like to use the, when, when I'm writing copy, I like to use the analogy at this point to say to myself, well, how am I at, at, what, at what point here am I, am I dropping in the benefits, the features and the benefits of my offer? Am I seasoning what I'm saying? Am I talking about their future state and then using my offers, features and benefits just as kind of like the salt and pepper? Or am I going heavy handed here at this point and, and just making it the you know, yeah. the main course, what trajectory, what trajectory am I on in my copy? How, how heavy handed do I want to be? Um, that's kind of the way that I view it. Um, and then you can, you know, lay it on thicker as you go or, you know, go in for the kill if you're ready. Yeah. And for I mean, it. I'm sure in a, in a short ad trying to get them to stream a song, like it's not a big chunky list of features and benefits. It's not a tightly woven two paragraphs that explains all those features and benefits. It's very, very brief, but you're able to kind of exactly. skim the cream off the top and just present that in that short space. So once again, the context is going to weigh heavily on, on how much and what you employ here. If it's an ad, short copy, there's not a lot of opportunity. So you're just going to use the best of the best, the most convincing or the, the most effective. And in an email, you might want, it's more personal. They're in a reading mode already. You, you might want to get the lead out there or on a sales page. So 
yeah, the, in this section, after you've gotten them to stop, you've gotten their attention, you've got their interests, you've made them understand that you're the same as you by using the psychological principle of influence liking. Now you're using a lot of convincing that is more direct and you're explaining to them the value of what you're offering. And by casting a future state, you're getting them to envision themselves in the use of that value, which is very important. Um, there's, I've read this like really dense, uh, study recently that went over like, um, marketing psychology and was talking about how, um, a head on approach typically fails because it, it, um, it doesn't require input from the reader. Um, when you can get the reader yeah. to start using their brain in understanding what you're saying and and having to inject themselves into the scenario, now you've got their active participation and that's 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 it. <laughs> yeah, it's so true. I mean, there's always going to be an element of what's in it for me. So if you can relay that in your copy, especially at the point where you're casting a future state and starting to talk about the value of your offer, this is where it's crucial to not lose the person in talking all about your offer and all about and making it about you. This is like really, I think like a pivot point. Um, and you know, it's something that I'm always monitoring my own copy for to be like, okay, don't lose them here. <laughs> like you got them this far. Don't lose them here by making it about you. Keep it yeah, about them. hundred percent. And, um, once you've explained the value of your offer, at the end of it, if there is a price associated with your offer, this is typically where you're going to disclose it, at least for the first time. And a lot of times, the best foot forward is to anchor that price. And anchoring is a, is a concept in copywriting and in psychology where we'll, we'll typically, if I just tell you, you know, if I just say the, if I just say the number 10, there's no context for understanding the size and the scope of that number. But if I say the number 20 before it, you understand that 10 is smaller. I could just say 20, 10, and immediately you feel about 10 that it's smaller, less significant, less of an impact, it's smaller. That I've anchored you with the number 20 for the context in which you're gonna understand the number 10. And so this is why in a lot of sales offers, you're going to see, we're going to give you this valued at this. We're going to give you this valued at that, but not for this, not for that, but for this much. They've anchored you all along the way to these higher prices and higher value to first get you to understand that this is a low number. They're giving you something because, you know, if you ask that the price is high or low in comparison to what? Well, they've given you that anchor to understand it, but they're also showing you the value of everything that's packed into the offer. And typically, you don't want your offer to be one bullet point. You want your offer to be broken down to its component parts that is tons of value. Um and and what I just described, the you know, uh, we're gonna give you the we're gonna give you the LED lights valued at valued at thirty dollars. We're gonna give you the ballast valued at forty dollars. We're gonna give you the the china balls valued at twenty dollars. But you get it all for just nineteen ninety five, right? That's called the stack. It's a common marketing term. If you've ever been to a webinar, you've seen it before, right? <laughs> the wonder, it, the wonderful value stack. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And it's cheesy. And it makes you want to punch yourself in the face. And it's not always appropriate to employ it, but it is something you're going to want to know because once you've convinced yourself of the value of the offer before you start writing the copy, the stack appears naturally. The, the only time it feels uncomfortable to do the stack is when you haven't yet sold yourself on the offer. Um, you'll feel a lot more comfortable once you really understand the value of it to the right person. I think about the first one of the first times that I probably – recognizably noticed the value stack and it was probably when I was buying my first guitar um, and you would open up like a you know a guitar center catalog or something like that and they had the the Fender Squire Strat packs that came with you know a cool black or red electric guitar with a 10 watt amp valued at $200 and a cable so that you can plug the two together and a pack of picks so that you don't need to buy them separately and the right kind of strings because you're going to break one and a tuner right. because you need to have a guitar tuner in order to play right. the guitar and all of these things were put into a put into a package that would usually cost 499 but 
for Memorial Day, we're giving it away for seventy nine ninety nine right. plus right. tax. And, and you typically, like when you first encounter this stack, naturally the first analog that we think of is infomercials, right? Because they do it all the time in infomercials. Yep. But wait, there's more, right? And uh, yep. But, but yep. what Jack just said there is so valuable because it's used everywhere. Fast food places, you it know, really the is. Guitar Center catalog. It's, it's used everywhere. And probably the thing that makes you uncomfortable about it is that you don't want to be an infomercial and you have nothing else to anchor it to, <laughs> right? You have nothing else to anchor your experience for understanding the stack to. So you just think... I, it's an it's an infomercial tactic, and I don't want to be an infomercial. I don't want to be salesy. Well, it's an everything tactic. It's used in everything. I've been yep. in lawyers' offices where they've stacked me. You know. <laughs> yep. Yeah. I I would encourage you if you're if you're listening and you're thinking about everything that we've been talking about here today, um, and and you've gotten to this point, just in the next couple of days, look right. for the stack. In places where you don't think you would normally find it. And I promise you, you will. And it will probably open your mind up about how you can use it for your yeah. own music um, and for your own offers in a, in a way that you've never thought totally, about before. Yeah. And, and that's not to say that you have to employ it, right? It's just a tool in your toolkit, right? Absolutely. Um, so when we come to price, which doesn't always have to be right here after you've explained the value, but oftentimes is... Um, Anchoring is important. The stack is a way to anchor, but not the only way, right? You can give the price and then say, now for comparison, this. In a lot of our video sales letters, I say, I give I give an anchor, right? So but I give the price first, which is probably bad practice, but it just feels more natural to me. But I think in one of our first video sales letters ever for FanFinder Bootcamp, I was saying, you know, $7, you could buy a Chipotle burrito for that. Now a Chipotle burrito is delicious, but it's not going to do X, Y, and Z for you. And those, X, Y, and Z, those are benefits, right? They're benefits I listed out before. And now you start to see where that all that ammo really comes into play when you're writing. Yep. And so- when, when you do reveal price, depending on the size of the price, there is the initial objection is that, okay, we've had a great time up until now. You showed me, you understand me. You walk me through this dream future state. Oh, but there's a price, right? And all of a sudden, a lot of that trust we've built up until now goes out the window. And that's sad, but it's true and it's natural. Um, you know, you can definitely, through some just critical thinking, understand why that's that's not really valid. It's not a good reaction, but it is a reaction that people often have. And so this is a great place to explain that, reiterate the value. And there's a lot of great ways to do this. Uh, my favorite way is testimonial. Immediately after revealing a price for anything, I want my best testimonial right afterwards because First of all, it's a non sequitur. I didn't like introduce this testimonial. I didn't say now here, here from like a happy fan, right? It's more like, okay, you're already removing yourself a little bit from this bit of copy. I, I can feel it. I can sense you doing it. So I'm just going to put in someone else who's not me, right? And, and let them tell you that it's worth it. And that can kind of reel you, reel you back to, to baseline. Um, and, and that's a good tactic, but there's ultimately you want to understand that immediately after revealing price, there are, there are ways to kind of bring everything back in. Yeah. I think actually one of my favorite ways is using testimonials as well. And I think one of the big reasons that I like it so much is that you can, you have certain, you have different kinds of testimonials that say different things and speak to, will speak to different kinds of people. You might have a testimonial from, you know, a fan that, resonates real I don't know let's just say for example you have a testimonial from uh, a female fan versus a male fan and you're trying to speak to the a, a female section right. of your audience well using you know using a testimonial from a female fan all of a sudden they're right. connected there um, I think those kind of things are really useful and with with testimonials you've kind of got some extra ammo to use there where you can connect who's speaking on your behalf or speaking positive positively about you and your offer um, and echo it back to the person that you're uh, trying to sell yeah, to. Yeah, and so totally. And and it can be simple. Like if you're on, if I'm on a sales page for your t-shirt, show me images of your actual fans wearing it because really what inserting a testimonial after price does is it's social proof. It shows, because I am I find myself in unfamiliar yeah. territory. I just got a good thing going with you and then you reveal the price 
and that feels aggressive maybe, but I need to feel like I'm not the only one. I need to feel like I'm not, you know, an idiot for considering doing this. And, and by showing them, no, this is something that real regular people like you do, you're giving that social proof, you're showing them it's kind of safe to proceed at least till the end of the sales copy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's kind of, by, by being able to show that social proof in the form of a testimonial, a photo, whatever it might be, um, you're kind of bridging the gap from the price to the future state of someone else that totally. they can yep. they can see and touch and yeah. feel and hold. They see it there and they're like, oh, okay, well, that person's just like me and here they are. You know, it's right in yeah. front of them. And so you want to reveal price ideally in copy. A lot of people make the mistake of doing it as like, oh, button price, right? Which is what like, unfortunately, out the box Shopify is doing to us. Like Shopify sales pages are the worst because they reveal price before anything's been said. And, and call you to action before anything's been said. And that's why we like, they're not ideal sales pages, but <clears throat> it can be done in the form of yeah. a button. All calls to action can just be a button, but ideally you're using some copy, some descriptive language to call them to action. Once you've explained the value of your offer, you're either revealing price or continuing forward, but ultimately by the end of the letter, you have to overcome objections and call them to action. Now, this is context dependent. You might not have space to overcome objections. You might just have to rely on the strength of what you've written thus far, and that's okay. But the best sales pages have a way to overcome objections. There's a number of ways to do it. But a great exercise would be to write out all the potential objections to your offer that the right person might have, not the wrong person, because the wrong person has no end to the objections they could raise but the right person only has so many. <laughs> this goes back to what we were talking about at the beginning of the episode about building a customer avatar. Um, if you can create, you know, create those objections, brainstorm those objections in the, in the customer avatar creation process, then you're not kind of doing this piecemeal. Right. <laughs> you can come up with what, what different segments of your audience, what objections they're going to have, why they're not going to buy something, um, why they might not be into your T-shirt, why they might not like a CD, why they might not want to come to your show. Um, and if you can think of those things ahead of time, it gives you ammunition for your copywriting. It'll make it quicker for you. And eventually this will kind of just become process like we're talking about here today. Um, it'll just become something that, and somewhat becomes second yeah, you, nature you kind to of you. feel you feel it like you feel the need to at the end of your letter or the end of your copy overcome those objections after a while yep and the the one arguably one of the greatest sales trainers or at least the most accomplished sales trainers of all time Zig Ziegler uh, said basically that once someone once someone understands the value of what you offer and it's more than the price, that's when they buy, no matter what. So if they're not buying, you have not yep. yet communicated the value to be more than the price. I'm not going to give you what well, he, he, he was a Southern man. And he said, he would be, I'm not going to give you this stack of money for that little stack of benefits. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and he's the great, I, I highly recommend reading or listening to Zeke Ziegler. Actually, listen to it because then you can hear his voice. Zeke Ziegler, uh, Secrets of Closing the Sale or something like that. It's an amazing book. Yeah, that's so good. And I mean, it, it comes back to, I feel like I'm sounding like a broken record, but it comes back to identifying those features and those benefits. How does what you offer, how does how does it benefit your audience? How does it benefit your customer? Yeah. Um, I mean, how much can you tell them about it? Yeah. <laughs> are you are you lining up the benefit and that future state that you're trying to get them to with your yeah. price? If you're not, then you need to reevaluate. And that's why salespeople have the confidence to continue talking to you after you say you can't afford it. Not because they feel like hammering something down your throat, but because they genuinely feel as if they have not yet communicated to you the value of it. Why? Because they see you as the exact right person for their offer and they believe in their offer. They actually believe in it. They actually believe it's the right thing for you. And so they're not gonna let you walk away not understanding that the value is higher than the price. That's why they go back into under, uh, uh, explaining the, the benefits. That's, that's why they immediately launch back into it, the best salespeople, is because they don't actually believe it's price. I mean, it is price, but not 
the, the price can't, if the price can't be adjusted, the benefits can, or the communication of those benefits can. So I, it took me forever to realize that. Like I used to, you know, like, kind of like, ah, I hate being salesy. I hate being sold to because it's uncomfortable because I just said that I can't afford it. And now you're talking to me again. Well, that often works because they know what the problem is. The problem is not the price. The price is pr probably pretty low, all things considered, because marketers craft offers that are highly valuable for the price. So it's that they haven't yet communicated that it's right for you or it's not right for you. And there's nothing you can do about that, but they're going to make damn sure they exhaust that option before. Right. It's so much about, it's, it's so much about comprehension on both yeah. sides, really. It's on the comprehension, the comprehension side of the person who's being sold to and, you know, the marketer comprehending that maybe they didn't communicate things as well as they could have, or, you know, evaluating their communication and making it better for the next best fit. Yeah. Prospect. The, the best artist salesperson in uh, all of Orlando is Swamberger of the Soliloquist of Sound. If you guys remember, I think it was episode 89 was with Da Vinci, who's his producer. Swamberger and his record label, Second Subject Records, these guys beat the street in Orlando selling tickets and records. And they're effective salespeople because, because of these principles. They, they stop you on the street. They believe in their product. They see what you're wearing. They know who you are. They feel as if they've got the right person. And then they treat it as if they have the exact right person. And they're not going to let you leave until you understand what they understand. They're transferring that feeling. And that's why believing in what you're offering and understanding the value of it is so important because all sales is a transference of feeling. And if you don't have that feeling yourself, they're not going to have it either. That's so good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Zee, I, I can't recommend that book <laughs> enough, Zeke Ziegler. But yeah, so that's one of the objections is price, right? Now, all other objections besides uh, besides it's not right for me, which is a valid objection. If it's not right for you, I can't do anything about that. But you have to explain to me why it's not right for you because everything else I've done up until this point almost guarantees I'm in front of the right person. I mean, if I'm offering you a product, it's only because you've interacted with me tons of times before because as, if you know the entrepreneur way, we're not offering products to people who haven't been pre-qualified through many interactions. So it's very rare that you'll find yourself in a position of offering something to someone who's not the right person. And that's why you need to have that level of confidence in overcoming objections because in general, overcoming objections is like is default state is discomfort. It's uncomfortable for someone to tell you that this is their truth and for you to say, oh, no, no, that's not the truth. But it's very necessary to kind of understand the psychology behind why you might do that because you've pre-qualified them. You've explained to them the, the value you've ensured that they're the right person. Otherwise they would not have read or stayed up until this point. So now you're not doing your job actually, if you let them get away with an objection, that's not valid. So price is a big one. Time can often be a big one. I don't have the time to, um, you know, if you're offering a CD, I don't have a CD player. Okay. Well, is listening to the music on the CD the core feature and benefit of that product? Oftentimes not. So you need to bring that back around. You need to explain, well, that's fine because we actually give you a digital copy of the album with the CD, but X feature, Y benefit, right? That has nothing to do with playing the CD. Right, exactly. And if any of this is feeling weird, going back to what we were talking about uh, in our last episode about is selling e evil or unethical. Um, if you're at this point and overcoming objections and continuing to talk to someone about the benefits of what they're getting with your offer feels weird, just remember, if they're at this point where you've pre-qualified them and they've interacted with you enough that you're in a position to make an offer to them, by not adequately explaining the benefit in your co copy and the value in your copy – you're doing a totally. disservice to them. And I think that's what we, that's what it comes back to when it, when we think about like the ethics of selling. Yeah. Um, so yeah, keep that and, in mind. And, and I think the, the analog here that provides discomfort is like you, you're thinking of, oh, you're at your telemarketing job that you got out of high school or college and you're calling someone who has no idea who you are and they're saying no and you're continuing to talk. And yeah, that is terrible. That is annoying. That is the wrong thing. But that's yep. not what we're talking about here. We, we would never sell under those contexts. Um, 
and some great salespeople do, don't get me wrong. I'm just saying that it's very difficult to find the psychological comfort with that scenario compared to the one we're talking about. Yeah, definitely not the recommended strategy for <laughs> for yeah. artists. Yeah, and then another uh, way to overcome objections, and specifically price. Like if you've exhausted all of the opportunity to reiterate the benefit and the value still does not seem like enough, well, you can use a risk reversal, which is very, very common in marketing and the best companies do it. And some companies are bullshit, including some of our competitors, but... <laughs> The risk reversal involves giving a guarantee or a warranty or some reason why their worry need not exist because if they don't like it, they can get all their money back or they can get it replaced if it doesn't work in the way that they're that they're worried it might not. And risk reversals are super important and also they're a math equation because uh, oftentimes people worry and I've worked with people who are like, oh, I'm not offering a, a guarantee. No. And it's like, Why? Because if you if you increase your sales rate by 10% and then you introduce a 5% refund rate, you've made more sales and revenue. You're, you know, like you're netting more. Yep. So I think people can be afraid of risk reversal, but for me, it's it's the most comfy thing in the world. And very, very rarely, like we've had a guarantee on our standalone training since the beginning of Entrepreneur. We've had to process maybe like on fan finder, like maybe 10 refunds over two years, just because people are generally honest. You know, if they give them something valuable, they're generally not going to try to screw you over or get one over on you. It, it doesn't feel right to do that. Yeah. And I mean, you see risk reversal all the time, especially in the e-commerce space. Like, and this goes back to, you know, musicians thinking about selling their selling their products making offers um money back guarantees you know if you don't like it send it back in 30 days and or or don't even send it back just let us know and we'll refund you yeah. and you keep it um that's a really powerful risk <laughs> risk yeah. reverse yeah and it's 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 not relying on not processing refunds like let me be clear it's not relying on anything except the honesty of people which is actually if you bet on your customers you bet on the audience you're talking to you usually win you usually win the math usually works out that you're going to get less refunds than you get an increase in sales um I've, I've actually never seen it not work out i've never seen someone take down a risk reversal because it costs them money so risk reversals are a great way to overcome price once you've kind of explained all the features and benefits because some people like, you know, depending on the level of relationship you, you've developed with them thus far, even if they do see it as more valuable, it might be a trust thing. They don't like, they don't trust that what you're saying is true. If it were true, yeah, that's more valuable than the cost, but I don't believe you. And risk reversal right. kind of takes care of that. Right. It just adds a little bit. I would, I, I would say it adds a little bit of extra teeth to your offer if you need it. Yeah. It's also... It's just a good thing to do. <laughs> like, it's kind of like being a good human. Like, <laughs> yeah. even if I have no danger of my audience not trusting me, which is often the case, like, you know, selling something a little bit higher up the value ladder, like in the ascension stage of the buddy system, like these people have had a good experience purchasing from you before. There's no reason to offer a risk reversal, but you do it because it builds brand equity. It makes people know that when they transact with you, it's a comfortable environment where there's not danger. Yeah. It makes people feel safe. I mean, like at the end of the day, you know, oh, what if, what if something bad happens to me and I'm on the line for, I don't know, <laughs> I'm on the line for Indie Pro for 37 a month and I just gave my last 37 a month away because I needed to buy groceries for my kid or something like that. There's that, sa there's a little bit of a safety that says, okay, well, like I trust this company and I know that they'll take care of me and they have my best yeah, interest 100%. at heart. And then the final portion, so you, you've gotten them to stop and read or stop and listen, grab that attention. You made them understand how you're similar to them. You've taken the steam out of this uncommon interaction and you've shown, brought everything down to the ground floor and said, I know what you're going through. I'm not a scary monster. Here's who I am and I'm like you. Then you explain to them knowing what they're going through and knowing what would benefit them and speaking consultatively, you're explaining to them the value of your offer. Then oftentimes you're, you're revealing the price or the, the kind of, you know, who, what, where, why, how of your offer and, and how they can take it. And then you're overcoming objections. 
And then lastly, call to action. Now call to action might be introduced as soon as the price, oftentimes as soon as the price is introduced, you should be introducing a call to action. Click here to apply, click here to purchase, uh, click here to get yours now, click here for instant access. Now, once that call to action comes out, wherever it comes out, do not make a standalone point and then another standalone point without kind of breaking it up with a call to action because every objection you overcome thereafter, every point you make thereafter might be the final one. And you don't want them searching for that call to action. It should be right there as soon as they've heard enough. And so you kind of want to have it at, at every step. And that's why you'll see like 10 calls to action buttons on our sales pages and on most sales pages is because we don't want you, once we've got you in that place where it's like, yeah, I understand it. I know who you are. I understand what I'm getting into. I know the price. I'm down. I want to do it. I don't want there to be any friction after that. I want to make it as easy as possible. And oftentimes in, in a bit of sales copy, one of the objections to overcome is usually, uh, it's going to be difficult to, to do. And so people, you, you'll often hear or read like, don't worry, all you have to do is this, or it's super easy. All you do is blank. That's overcoming an objection and calling to action at the same time. Um, you know, and then in an email, there might be like one last objection after the, after the sign off, which you'll obviously like PS in case you're worried blank, don't worry, blah, 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 call to action. And so after you've explained the value of your offer, You've closed the main pitch. Everything after that is overcoming objections and and recalling to action. Yeah, I mean, with when it, when it comes to setting up your calls to action, if if we're taking and we're spending all this time and energy on breaking down people's objections or overcoming people's objections, you certainly don't want to put up more barriers by introducing another one and not giving a call to action directly yeah. after it. <laughs> you don't want to break them down to build up another one and not give people the out that they're looking for when they say, Oh, all right, I get it. I'm ready to go. And there's, there's not a way out. Um, so that's definitely really, really important. Um, and like you said, Cirque, that's one of the reasons that you see so many call to actions on yeah. sales pages. Um, you'll see the button multiple yeah. times. And so I think we've fully kind of exhausted what goes into a great sales letter. Now, we, this podcast could be 10 hours. If you ever read Ultimate Sales Letter by Dan Kennedy, you'll see just how long this podcast could be because there's all these different tips and tricks and tools you can employ to accomplish basically what we've gone over here, which is first put yourself in the, in the proper starting point. Understand your offer, understand the features and benefits, understand the objections to taking the offer. Then understand who you're talking to 100%. Then your, your offer, your bit of copy should go like, get, get that attention, generate interest, generate desire by explaining the value, and then call to action. And then overcome objections if necessary. Now, in an ad, you're going to be throwing out parts of this. Parts of this will be necessary. You might not overcome objections. In an opt-in page, you probably don't need to overcome objections because all they have to do is enter the email. But as the ask gets higher, you'll see all of this exhausted. So most sales pages, I mean, any sales page worth its salt has every little bit that we've gone over. Yeah, I think like you were saying, it's it's a matter of at, at this point, it's again, going back to context. What are you writing for? Um, what are you writing for and who are you writing it to? Yeah. Um, and then you can decide which of these pieces you can swap in and out um, as need be based on the length of the copy that you're going to be working with. Yeah. And I've seen like, don't get me wrong. I've seen two sentence bits of copy or something someone said from stage that contains the, the essence of all of these points. You can do it in two sentences. You can get my attention, show me how you're like me and that I shouldn't be scared of you and that you understand me. And then explain to me the value of what you're offering, overcome objections, and call me to action in two sentences. It is possible. And without like some clever wordplay, like it's just that the sentences themselves accomplish that. It, you know, you, it, you can look at it after the fact and say, yes, they hit all of these points. Yeah, I've, cl I've clicked many a Facebook ad or a Go even a Google ad <laughs> um, that has done exactly that in very yeah, short Yeah, so form. like as you get better at copywriting, you'll kind of start to see these things. Um, and you'll see how it can be communicated very effectively, very quickly. But that doesn't mean that 
you shouldn't throw some of it out if it's getting in the way. Like you shouldn't be seeking to overcome objections in every Facebook ad or every opt-in page. But when you get down to there to like the videos, the emails, the sales pages, yeah, you really want to exhaust your options and, and do a good job as 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 a communicator. It's what a salesperson is, except you're communicating opportunity, you're communicating future states. Um, and and that's really it, man. That's that's what goes into copywriting is all of these points. And if you really want to dive deep on it, you can um, you can read any of these resources. I'm going to leave them in the show notes. If you go to entrepreneur.io slash episode 93, you're going to see links to a lot of my favorite resources on copywriting. The last thing I'll say here is that one thing we didn't mention, which is a little bit more advanced, but also, you know, kind of cut for time is that um, how you craft your offer is part of copywriting. So like you're not limited to you have a band t-shirt. Do you have anything else lying around in inventory you can throw in that package? Can you do something manually that adds value to it? Can you give them a coupon? What can you add to the offer? Because there's nothing worse for a bit of sales copy than a boring offer. And boring offers are a single bullet point. Yep. More than half of the time that, that, that people reach out to me and say, my ads aren't working. I'm not getting more sales. My, you know, my email brought in no revenue. Yeah. It's the offer. <laughs> Joe, so Joe many Polish times, said it's there's the offer. only ever um, offer problems. That's what he said. <laughs> yep. Uh, we were working with a, uh, speaking of t-shirt and you mentioned like, do you only have a t-shirt? Do you have extra in inventory lying around? Can you do something extra manually? We were working with one of our agency clients and uh, they were running, they were running a crowdfunding campaign and they had like a bunch of like extra stock of t-shirts that they wanted to include as an incentive in this campaign. Well, they went the extra mile and made this, took it to the next level. And instead of just offering the t-shirt, which like really is not a good incentive, a good offer at all um, by itself, they said, okay, well, we're going to paint a speech bubble on this on this t-shirt like hand paint a speech bubble with like a message for each person who buys this t-shirt that was cool and it sold a yeah. lot of t-shirts um so that yeah, was really really just a neat way to take an ordinary product and make it an offer and there's like literally that's that is a, a needle in a haystack there is so much that you can do to uniquify an offer. Gary Halbert was the the champion of all time of this. Uh, he, I yep. can't think he posed it as like, if I offer you a Volkswagen at sticker price, that's not very exciting. But if I add a little bit to that price and then I tell you that I'm gonna give you a Volkswagen and gas for the first year you drive it, I'm gonna pay all your gas and I'll hand deliver it to you and give you the keys myself. That's a lot more exciting than a Volkswagen at sticker. And there's nobody here saying that you can't raise or lower or modify your price or any element of your offer to make it more exciting. If you want to add value to it, but it's going to be too much of a cost, raise the price. Because oftentimes, a more interesting offer will overcome a marginal increase in price. And that's important to remember. Is if, Even if it costs $5 extra on the offer, what they get for that $5 might be way more interesting than the disparity of, you know, $5 less in cost. Exactly. It goes back to the idea of the value that you're offering is going to outweigh or overshadow the cost of what it's going to, you know, what somebody's going to have to take out their wallet and pay you for. And yeah. there's a lot, there's so many ways to do that. It's really, it's, it's only limited by your creativity. Yeah. And, and there, there are also like zero cost ways and zero time cost ways. Like you could just decide to never print that t-shirt again in the, in the iteration yeah. that it is. Right. And that's my favorite way. Cause I'm a junkie for streetwear and limited edition clothing. And if I hear that it's one of 1000 ever, I need to be one of those 1000 people, you know, it's just yeah. like something I'm enticed by. And so by saying, okay, we're never going to print this again. It's no cost to you, right? Only the cost of that graphic design not realized. But like, I mean, to be honest with you, how many times are you going to reprint that and recoup the, the cost of that graphic design anyways? Probably much less than right. if you successfully sold it out the gate. So that there's, there's a lot of different ways to uniquify an offer that don't bring into consideration a, a, an additional cost to you. Something that Disney would do back in the day is they would take out, uh, they would call it, they would take out their, you know, their movies from the Disney vault 
and you would see commercials for The Lion King where you could buy it on DVD and VHS right. in a packet. I don't know why anyone would do that, but they would <laughs> buy it on DVD and VHS in a packet. And But you had to do it in the next you know 30 days or it was going back in the Disney vault and then you wouldn't be able to buy it again. Yeah, um, I don't um, I don't know if they're still doing that, but that oh, that has stuck with me since I was a kid because I always thought it was a really, really cool idea. Um, yeah. So same and sort of thing. That's that's a perfect segue, because the, the last thing that we didn't go over extensively in this in this episode, because it's not absolutely crucial to an artist offering their fans a product, but it is crucial in almost every other buying scenario is scarcity and urgency. If your product is yeah. limited, if the offer is limited, if you're only adding this bonus for the first hundred people who buy, if there's a countdown timer, if, if it's never going to be sold again, all these things increase the likelihood that I'm going to, like, let's say I got a little bit of friction. Let's say like I'm nitpicking. I really want the offer, but I'm just kind of being a dick about it. Right. <laughs> then like, yeah. <laughs> a little bit of scarcity, a little bit of urgency is going to make me say, oh, that little extra 1% I could have gotten in value by by kind of being a stickler, I'm just going to go right by that. I'm not going to consider that important because I might miss out. The fear of missing out is such a compelling emotion and it drives most of the stock market and cryptocurrency and it drives most buying decisions as well. So it's something that you can inject in anywhere in your offer, especially in explaining the value or, or revealing the price that will get people off the fence. 100% play on that FOMO. Yeah, exactly. And it, like I said, we, we didn't go over it extensively here just because it it's not the best copywriters don't have to do it. It's something that amateur copywriters rely on a lot more than experienced ones, but it definitely helps. And it's not appropriate for every offer, every time, but it's probably the most commonly used sales tactic. Definitely. Yeah. So hopefully we've we've kind of exhausted all of your options here. Hopefully we've really given you a full template to write great copy with. And the first two things we went over, putting yourself in place, understanding the value of what you're offering, that's going to happen in every scenario. But the rest of it, you're, gonna, you're going to kind of uh, titrate up or down depending on the context. And, and hopefully we've given you enough ammo to do that. Yeah, definitely. I think this was really fun to give a, a high level overview of what a copywriting process might look like and then, you know, go into the nitty gritty of what all of it means. It was a lot of fun. Hell yeah. And so uh, this, this is Jack's final episode on Creative Juice until the next time. So thank you so much for joining us, Jack. We really appreciated you hey, lending your hey, expertise. It, it, was a, it was a blast. Thanks for having me. This has been so much fun and I hope that uh, everybody got as much enjoyment out of it as I did. Hell yeah. And we'll see the rest of you Indies next week on Creative Juice.